Exactly. Now, that's because that was the topic and that's what we were invited to discuss. However, now having been invited to discuss where is the transition made from the creator God to a religion and a series of beliefs, I'll offer you in a nutshell a Jewish response. If there is a God who created the human, then it strikes me, again, purely on logical grounds, that God would care about how the humans that God created fare. If we care about how humans fare, it would seem that the creator of us would care how we fare, or we are superior to our creator. I find that notion possible, but unlikely. So the odds are that God did care if we were good to each other. And so he, this is my read, that God f implants a conscience in the human being. It obviously failed, and whether you take it as an allegory or literally, and I am more toward the allegorical, but it does irrelevant. It, I'm totally happy with those who take it literally. It means nothing to me which way you go. The very first two human beings are brothers, and one murders the other. Clearly, something goes awry very quickly, and so God then destroys the world because he's interested in our being good. There are, I have never had a moral problem with Noah's flood. I'm not, I'm not even arguing for a literal understanding. I'm arguing for taking the, the, the story and what it means. It means that God wants goodness to prevail. If it doesn't, there is no purpose to human life. He starts over again and gives Noah a series of laws to live by since conscience was not enough. That doesn't work, and God makes a third attempt to make the world better and gives a very explicit revelation of moral law to a small people, a particularly miserable people, a particularly ugly people, and a particularly small people called Hebrews. They are slaves. Slave mentality is a very low form, the lowest form of human mentality. And God chooses this tiny group, not because it's at all better. In fact, the, the Bible itself says you're not better than anybody else. In fact, you're smaller. You're nothing. And, uh, and if that group can elevate itself among the peoples and be, and be in some ways a moral light, which, which Jews have been despite the number of miserable Jews as there are miserable peoples of any group, but Judaism did give Christianity did give the moral ideals that the Western world lives by, and Jews did become a, a people that elevated itself in, in many ways, then it's ascribed to this third revelation from Adam the conscience to Noah, a universal uh, a series of few laws, to a lot of laws to one people to try to embody it. Now, I would like to add at this point a fourth, can you give me a minute? 40 seconds. How do we go from a minute to 20 seconds inside of 10 seconds? All right, I will Take just... One okay, I just... There is something she's I want to... She's the of God in this podium. I'm sorry? She's oh, there the, we go. She's playing God in the podium. Correct. I do want to add something here because then comes Christianity, and I want to just... In, in, you know, the, the time factor is, is, is more troublesome than even on radio when I have to break for commercials. But, but nevertheless, it's inevitable, and I appreciate that. A, a very quick word on how this religious Jew sees Christianity, because you heard how a religious Christian sees Judaism. I believe that Christianity, when, when rooted in the Hebrew Bible, as indeed Christianity in America certainly has been, this has been a very Judeo-Christian Christianity in America. I believe it is an expression of divine will. I do not believe that there is only one road to God, nor does Judaism. The most orthodox Jew in the world, the most insular, most isolated orthodox Jew would never say that only Jews can reach God or only Jews are saved. It has never, ever, ever been a Jewish position. Those who come to this God and to this Ten Commandments, these are doing God's will. I see the Christians of America having done God's will and a form, if you will, of divine revelation in its way. And that is the reason many Christians find it remarkable how much I defend Christians. But after all, Dennis, don't you believe there's only one truth? I believe there's only one empirical truth, but I don't believe there is only one way to God, and nor does my religion. And so I just want to explain how I can accommodate so well while being a truly believing Jew, so how I can so accommodate 
to the achievement of the Christian, especially in America, where we share this basic body of values called Judeo-Christian. Thank you. It's, um, it's particularly delightful and challenging to debate these issues from sort of multiple perspectives. If Christopher feels a little bit of excessive ecumenism on the side of Dennis and me, I, I, I'm going to be departing from that in just a moment. Uh, but I do want to say a couple of things first. Uh, and that is the problem of evil, the problem of cruelty, of harsh, unnecessary suffering is often posed as an exclusive dilemma or difficulty for the believer. I want to suggest it is no less a difficulty for the atheist. And why? Because if we are Darwinian primates, driven by an imperative to survive and reproduce, we would in general only commit that evil which was necessary to that end. The amount of evil in the world, its scale, staggers the mind. It has no reproductive benefit. It has no survival advantage. Look at the animal kingdom. You might have a lion that wants to eat an antelope, but you don't have a lion that wants to wipe out all the antelopes off the face of the planet. <laughs> In a sense, when we see horrible things, a serial killer, we say that was a bestial act you did, but it's wrong. Beasts don't act that way. So there is something peculiar about the nature of man that makes him capable of a degree of evil that is, goes way beyond Darwinian necessity, requires almost a alternative explanation. Now, because he's created in God's image. Um, no. Now, what I want to say is, why have the atheist killings of the 20th century been so terrible? I think the answer is simple. Christopher mentioned earlier Dostoevsky's maxim, if God is not, everything is permitted. I want to give you Nietzsche, the philosopher Nietzsche, probably the greatest atheist thinker of the last 150 years, his interpretation of this. But basically what Nietzsche says is that if you remove God... Many people want to get rid of God, but hang on to the morality that the idea of God brought into the world. But you really can't do this. If you get rid of God, you get rid of the foundation of those values that emanated out of the transcendent idea. For, the, for example, the simple idea that you owe equal respect and dignity, not just to a family member or a neighbor, but to a complete stranger. From a Darwinian point of view, this is completely senseless. There is absolutely no reason that one should extend bonds of sympathy, for example, to someone starving in Rwanda. They are nothing to me. We have no genes in common. Uh, now, religion is a theory of cosmic justice. If you think of the Hindu idea of reincarnation, you were a jerk in, your, in the way you've acted, well, you're going to be a cockroach in your next life. So religion introduces the idea that even though life is unfair and many times in life the bad guy ends up on top and the good guy comes to grief, there will be a final accounting in the end in which what goes around comes around. And I want to submit that theists who did bad things had to pay attention to this. Even if, even if Torquemada was a horrible guy, if he was a believer, he had to worry about the last judgment. But Stalin did not and Mao did not and Pol Pot did not. Do I have a moment for a final thought about Christianity? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Human beings are at this level, down here, but we have within us this aspiration to perfection, perfect beauty, perfect justice, perfect truth. Man is down here, God is up here. I see most of the religions of the world as trying to create a ladder from man to God, follow these rules, perform these diets, obey these commandments. It's the premise of Christianity that these ladders, however well constructed, cannot reach their destination. It's too high. Man can't get up there. God has to come down. God has to condescend to the human level. That's the only way to close the chasm. And so in Christ, symbolically, we see, in a sense, God becoming man, a way to reach down to man, bridge that gap, and open up an opportunity, you might say, for human salvation. Thank you.